Um, yep, as, uh, as Simon said, um, I work for Microsoft in the advocacy team. Um, I, but I'm a web developer by trade. I've been doing web development for nearly 20 years. Uh, we won't say exactly how close to 20 years, but just leave it out there to imply I'm actually old. Uh, if you want to find me online, um, there's the various social media and website URLs and emails. Like if, if I have anything that you uh, talk about today that you don't get answered, um, please feel free to, to see me afterwards or to shoot me an email or reach out to me on social media or any of that kind of stuff. But you're here to learn about serverless containers and Azure. So naturally when we talk about serverless on Azure, the first thing we're going to think about is Azure Functions. Azure Functions has been our you know, traditionally the most common serverless platform that you would think of. Um, you know, there are other things with inside of Azure that have been around for a while, things like um, Power Automate and Logic Apps, um, container instances and stuff like that. But this is really what people think when they think serverless. Uh, uh, Azure Functions, so it, it fits for uh, the, what a lot of commonality that uh, people have when they think of serverless as well. It's an event-based architecture. So something's happening, whether it's an inbound web request coming in via HTTP, it's a message being dropped into a queue on, I'm getting feedback, is, are people hearing feedback? Yeah, and like, I can, the mic and just talking really loud and that still seems to have feedback. Have you changed the lapel mic? Try the other lapel mic? Uh, at the back, can you still hear me? Because I'm content to just yell really loud uh, and that will solve the uh, feedback problem, hopefully. Uh, uh, but if it's picking up off the room audio, you said, let's have a look. That's all right. People know all about Azure Functions, so no, they'll be able to <laughs> keep in mind. It'll be interpretive dance Azure yeah. Functions. Uh, Simon is wearing the t-shirt, so he will be my standing for the, the dance. I'm not even going to try this. There's, there's so much that could go wrong with making that. that uh, okay, back, back on track, less feedback, all that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, Azure Functions, it, like you said, it, it does the things that you think about when you think serverless. It's a code first approach, so you know, we, we write our um, application uh, based off of the events that we're going to be listening to. Um, I, I know a lot more of this architecture is leaning towards web based events, so you know, like HTTP, um, GRPC, and that kind of stuff, and being uh, those triggers coming in. You perform something. Um, I, I, I'm a huge fan of Azure Functions. Like I, I, I love the model. I love the integration piece and stuff like that. What a lot of people don't know about Azure Functions is that you can actually use Azure Functions with containers today. So uh, you can actually bundle Azure Functions app in a Docker container and deploy that to Azure. Now you might be wondering, well, why would I do that? Like, what, what value is that bringing that I'm not getting out of Azure Functions in its current model? Like, I, you know, I just I write some code, I push it up with GitHub Actions or whatever pipeline you're using, and you know, it, it all takes care of it. Like, but why would I want to put it in a container? Um, there's a couple of scenarios where containerization is going to make sense for Azure Functions. One of those is maybe you're trying to bring in a dependency that is a more system level than you get out of the restricted environment that you have in Azure Functions. Right? When you deploy on Azure Functions, kind of bare metal, it's, it might be serverless, but there are still servers there. But I'm not going to try and lie that there's no servers. There, are, there is a server somewhere. Um, but you know, there are restrictions on what you can install, you know, whether it's like a, a node module that's um, that's working with a uh, subsystem library or something that's compiled from, um, from from C, C++ to work with Node, or maybe it's something that's um, a, a native .NET package that you're trying to leverage it. You know, there's um, a bunch of stuff that you can't put on an Azure Functions instance managed by Azure just because um, it represents a potential security vulnerability. So that's where Docker might make sense. You can, because you own that container and you own that container um, like boundaries, uh, it might be a bit, uh, make sense to deploy that as a container. Another scenario where containerization might work for Azure Functions is that if you're wanting to do maybe a hybrid infrastructure model where you've got some of your stuff is on-prem, some of your stuff is the cloud, you want to go down the route of serverless but you're not ready to go serverless hosting in the cloud, well, you could then um, roll in Azure Functions into a Docker container and deploy that on, on your own internal infrastructure, just on your own you know, managed Kubernetes infrastructure or you know, like single instance Docker and stuff like that. Now, obviously, you're not going to get the value of scalability of Azure Functions for that, but if the programmatic model is what you're looking for more than the scalability, then it might make sense. Um, the third scenario <coughs> where Azure Functions inside of a Docker container would make sense is if you're trying to do something on the edge, like you're doing edge computing, whether you're Things like a really low powered device that's running out somewhere, or um, like other forms of edge computing that can support containerization. Well, this is a way that you can run uh, like event based workloads on the edge using Azure Functions. 
So it, it, it makes sense for a number of scenarios that are not your, your traditional surface. I mean, if you're running on the edge, you're like even further from surface like, because you're at the edge. Uh, it sounds like I'm doing a virtual conference with the amount of uh, like laughter I'm getting back. It's it's awesome. And I forgot to bring my stream deck with my laugh track. Uh, that's what that's something that I've enjoyed in the pandemic is bring my own laugh track because then I'm super funny when I'm presenting. <laughs> Thank you for that again. I see like a few people suppressing laugh. <laughs> um, if you want to learn a bit more about it, uh, you feel free to quickly scan the QR code. Um, mostly because the URL is like really long, so I'm not expecting someone to write down a 30 character URL. Um, but also uh, tweet out some of these links afterwards, um, you'll find on social media, or you can grab it off the video recording after the fact. So that, that's the talks about how we can deploy Azure Functions uh, and using Docker to, uh, to Azure. But let's also just have a look at a demo and, and see what's different from the development experience for this. Um, so this is like really low. Maybe I should sit down. No, it'll be fine. Okay. So uh, I've got, uh, I'm, I'm using WSL here. Um, and down the back is that font size fine from the big TV, or would you like it up a little bit? Cool. Uh, Simon, Simon's old, so he's saying increase. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's, let's just pop it up. Uh, just humor me. There we go. OK, so um, I, I've yeah, got a folder here. Um, and uh, this is on WSL, so I'm running on, on Linux. Um, and what uh, am I going to be uh, doing here? Well, I've already installed the Azure Function Core Tools, uh, so I've got those installed in this folder just so I had the right version. Um, so I'll be using NPX to execute it rather than just Funk, which is the, like, the normal command line. But um, if you're confused uh, or if you're unfamiliar with NPX, all it does is it says run a node package from a local folder rather than from a uh, from the like a global instance. So we can do NPX uh, Funk and if I scroll up through my history, I will get the one that I prepared earlier. Uh, so fun in it, um, we specify our worker runtime. So we're doing .NET, .NET isolated, Python, Java. In this case, we're going to do JavaScript. Um, and the only thing we're going to do differently if we want to deploy this with Docker is to add the dash dash Docker flag to the end. So uh, give that a, a whirl, and it will create me a new folder. And let's open that up in VS Code. Find where that VS Code instance is going to be. One of these screens, there it is. Um, and so this is just an empty functions app at this point in time. Uh, what it has done is uh, 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 different to, uh, yep, I trust my own code. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> um, so uh, really the only difference between uh, like whether you use Docker or whether you're not using Docker is that it's added a Docker file to it. Um, and we can see that this is using the functions node base image. Um, if you're using Python, obviously you have a Python based image, .NET, .NET based image, um, and it's just setting up the, the kind of the common things that you'll need for, for that to run. So where are you putting the code, um, and it's going to perform an npm install while you do image create. So it has all the packages you're going to need to run. Um, I don't actually have a uh, like any um, uh, templates or like I don't actually have a function. So we'll do npx func uh, create no, uh, new. I'm just going to create a HTTP trigger. Um, that's uh, super basic. Uh, it's just going to be, this is going to be your standard template um, scaffolding up uh, sort of a demo. Because the interesting thing is not the demo, the interesting thing is hopefully the fact that it's running with inside the container. Uh, so here's our get message. Oops. It is just listening for a HTTP uh, binding. So uh, that's the trigger that we're using for this Azure function. Uh, and it's just going to do some stuff, send back a HTTP response. Standard web book or you know, API endpoint. Um, the only thing I forgot to do uh, is that um, I, because I'm going to run this locally, I'm just going to change the authorization to anonymous, uh, so I don't have to pass in a function token uh, for that. So they're just anyone can call this. That's the point of the uh, anonymous model, but you know, it's still going to have all the same um, like authentication uh, practices that you get from Azure Functions. So if you're using um, and like and, and, uh, the access token access to it, you would still need to provide that as the query string or um, whichever it may be. Cool. So that's ready, and we can go npm start. Uh, so this will start up the Azure function. It will be just running locally. Um, it is not. Uh, it's going to give me a warning because I'm using uh, wrong version of Node uh, in a moment. Um, but it, it's up and running, and this is just running locally on my machine. This is not running in Docker at this point in time. To do this, we would do a Docker build, um, and we'll just create a uh, a tagged um, container here. 
Uh, I've already run this a few times to save myself uh, downloading a heap of uh, new images. At least it shouldn't have done that. I, I literally did this like 30 minutes ago to make sure I had the cache warm. And here it is downloading hundreds of names. Thankfully, it's on the NBN, so it's going to be super fast. Everyone just talk amongst yourselves for the next 45 minutes. Uh, anyway, there we go. Okay, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad, only 21 seconds. Um, so, this is, uh, so this is building the Docker image. It's bringing in all the code that we had inside of our uh, application, uh, sorry, inside of our code base. It's going to uh, run any of the steps that you've got in Docker. So this is where uh, you could be installing some additional, like this is running Linux, um, some additional Linux dependencies. Maybe you're, uh, you've got to bring something in from Apt or from um, uh, like another package manager, that kind of stuff. Uh, and there we go. Okay, it's up and running. So we go Docker, Docker run. Um, and because this is listening on the HTTP trigger, I need to bind an outbound port. So dash P, I'm going to bind this to port 8080 uh, on my machine. That's going to pass through to port 80 on uh, the container so that uh, it's running and can execute HTTP requests. Cool. So that should start off in just a second. There we go. Excellent. Uh, so now this is running with inside of our container. And as proof, that it does work, we can go localhost 8080. Uh, so this shows that uh, Azure Functions are running on that. And lastly, if we go to API get message, uh, I didn't pass a query string, so it's given me just the generic uh, template back. And if we were to pop down to, I can find, where's my mouse? There's my mouse. Uh, if I just bring up uh, Doc for Windows, we can see that. Here is a running container. So like, now I could push this up to a container registry, or I could um, I could use some like CI/CD tool to build that container uh, and then deploy that to a container registry, like maybe a private registry that we can pull down. But there we go. Like that is how we can containerize Azure Functions so that we can you know, do the sorts of things that we might want out of a container that we can't do on just Azure Functions as raw infrastructure. If you then deploy this to Azure as Azure Functions, um, there is an option when you're scaffolding up an Azure Functions resource uh, that will ask if you want to use uh, Docker as the, the thing that you're deploying. Uh, and you can do that there, and then it will then we'll have the scalability models that you like from Azure Functions, you know, the, the dynamic scale and scale to zero and all that kind of stuff. Um, obviously, it, it won't be quite as potentially performant as you would get out of on bare metal because you've got to do containerization starts. That's where you, yeah. so you, you, you kind of have the cold start of containers rather than just cold start of functions itself. <laughs> so that was uh, demo number one for today. But I want to talk a bit more about serverless containers. So kind of taking this idea of, uh, of, of, of containerization was, um, uh, for serverless applications a little bit further than just uh, like Azure Functions because while like, I do like Azure Functions and it, it solves for a lot of problems that are, uh, and there's a lot of scenarios where I would use, uh, that I use Azure Functions for, um, I also really like it's free. Uh, you know, not that I'm cheap or anything. Like some might pay me, but they don't give me free Azure credits that much. Uh, I still have to pay for that stuff. Um, I, so I still like, I, I like to look at what are other ways I can do proper applications. like. If I can't run a website in Azure Functions. That's not really ideal. Like, sorry, you can run a website. Don't do it. Just you can. You put it in a container and you can. Just don't do it. It's not the best option. So how do we how do we do more of a serverless infrastructure design but have a more complex application? Yeah, before I talk about how to answer that question, I just want to kind of frame what I mean when I say serverless. Um, contains in this regard. So the, the sorts of things that I'm looking for from serverless here are things like this infrastructure scalability. You know, like I don't want to have to think about how many servers do I need to deploy or, or how many containers am I having to provision or like how many pods do I need for a Kubernetes cluster. Like that's something that I shouldn't have to think about because that's the thing that serverless gives me. That's the scalability stuff that I really like. So how do I get that kind of a model? I also like this idea of scale to zero. So that's something that Azure Functions does. Uh, if no one is calling my, uh, no, no triggers are um, firing off the Azure Functions, it'll scale to zero. And I don't pay for anything because it's not being used. Um, so how do I get a scale to zero when maybe I have something that's a bit more complex than you know, some, uh, some event-based trees? Like I have maybe a web application that's running. How do I scale to zero that without having to think about writing a whole bunch of scripts that you know, start it back up when someone's hitting my website and they're like, well, oh, but you're offline. 
Um, and back to the idea of managing infrastructure. Uh, function apps work well because you can have a bunch of things deployed in a single function app, but how do you then grow that if you're building a microservices infrastructure? Is one single monolithic Azure Functions the right way to do a, a microservices infrastructure? I know you're probably not. And then if you're not doing microservices, maybe you're doing a bunch of monoliths that are all connected together. They talk to each other, you have a web front end, maybe you have a separate admin portal. If this is all related infrastructure you want to deploy and manage. If that's where that things like Kubernetes advertise themselves as solving the problem because it, you, you can manage this complex infrastructure together as a single deployment set. But as someone who has, has used Docker for five or six years now, I have still never used Kubernetes because I cannot learn that much out of it. Um, so I want a way that I can use something that has that kind of infrastructure management that I don't want to have to learn infrastructure management. I'm not an infrastructure person. I'm a web dev. Well, Last year at Ignite, we launched a preview service called Azure Container Apps. And this is essentially ser uh, serverless scaling for containers for complex applications. Well, you can always kind of do that with things like Azure uh, Container Instances and you know, Azure Functions. Obviously, you can do that with, uh, with serverless infrastructure, uh, sorry, with containerized infrastructure. But Container Apps was more like how do you do a, a, an application that is a bunch of things co communicating together? Whether we want to call it microservices or it's a distributed monolith, that's entirely up to you and how you identify with your architecture. Now, uh, Azure Functions, it's uh, sorry, Container Apps is built on a whole bunch of open source tech. So this is not like uh, something that is locking you into anything too uh, like vendor specific. It's Kubernetes under the hood. It uses things like the Kubernetes event-driven architecture to auto scaling, sorry, to, to do the scalability models that we have, and that's Kata. Um, it uses a distribution, a distributed application runtime or Dapper to do communication between the services that you've got deployed. Um, it uses Envoy as like a management backplane inside of all of that. So it's like I said, it's, it's containerized, um, uh, serverless containerization. Um, like you you can respond to things like HTTP events, but you can also respond to other kinds of events. Are we getting CPU overload on one of the pods in my uh, my deployment? Are we, like, are we hitting memory limits? Are we hitting other scale metrics you know, through our database, through event queues, um, service bus, stuff like that? You, uh, like, are those things telling us that, well, you probably need to scale up. You know, that's the sort of stuff that Azure Function takes care of. That's the point of service. It's, uh, you're getting things that are telling you you need to scale, and it will scale for you. Uh, we can do that through um, uh, through uh, Kata, but it also brings in HTTP, which is one thing that Kata doesn't do natively. Um, it's, uh, it's also designed from like a development a development mindset. So it's it's not about uh, how do I manage infrastructure, how do I think about the infrastructure that's going to scale for my solutions. Uh, it's how do I build the applications and just deploy them. You know, whether it's uh, like using GitHub Actions to do CI/CD as like an automated deployment process, or whether you're using some other um, pipeline management tool, or you're just you, know, you push from local machine. Like friends don't let friends right click in Visual Studio and deploy to production. But you know, people do that, and there's there's valid scenarios where that might work. Um, the, the thing with uh, with container apps is that it means that you're forced to think about the, the infrastructure you deploy because you have to think in a container mindset. <coughs> um, and, and the last thing, and I, 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 I like to reinforce this point is that it uses open source uh, because too often we see. You know, new products come out and it's like it can be or it can feel like vendor locking here. How do I do this? Well, you're gonna to have to learn a whole bunch of you know, new tools or new technologies and things that are very specific to that approach. This is built on Kubernetes. So if, if you're already familiar with Kubernetes, this um, isn't a, like it's a service that should fit the kind of models that you're familiar with. Uh, you, um, we're not trying to reinvent a new way of doing auto scaling. Um, uh, we're, we're using Kater as a, as a tool to do that. It actually started as an open source project at Microsoft and uh, was contributed to the CNCF. So it's, it's not a Microsoft project. And it can integrate with other cloud vendors and, uh, and their event systems, like AWS stuff and GCP stuff. Um, you know, Dapper and Envoy and things like that. They're, again, they're all open source tools that we're just trying to package up and make it simpler for you to, to not have to think about how you build and deploy applications. Um, yeah. One thing that, uh, when I was talking to the, the Container Apps team, uh, I was like, oh, I, like, I really like the idea of Container Apps, but I'm not doing microservices. 
Um, and I know that a lot of the people that I talk to don't do microservices. Like they, they want to get down to that end. Like that's a goal that they have in the future if they like to have more of microservices architecture. So like it's container apps for them. Um, and this is uh, something that they're, uh, that they're very much wanting to change perceptions of with container apps is that you can deploy a single instance to a container app that's just running a website. It doesn't need to be microservices. You can have a distributed monolith. You can have a like a single backend with a single front end. That, that's fine. You can even use it for batch processing. Because of that scale to zero, right? um, it, it will when your events come in, it will trigger that off. It will scale up to the needs that you have for um, that point in time to, uh, to just run that batch through, and then it will scale back down to zero, and you're not paying for it. Kind of like what Azure Functions does, but potentially with more flexibility because of what you can do out of the containerized uh, containers approach. Um, and just before I jump into a demo of this, because um, I have no idea how I'm tracking the time, I forgot to start my uh, stopwatch. Um, and like I said, you're stuck with me for you know, however long I'm up here because I'm the last talk of the day. Ten, uh, ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten-ish minutes. Ten-ish minutes. Excellent. I can I can work to that. We'll see if Azure can work to that. So as well. it should be that now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, hour, forty-five minutes, hour. Yeah, we'll see. Um, so so Kato is <coughs> it before. It's something that uh, it started as a Microsoft project. Uh, that we then um, passed to, uh, turned into an open source project and released to CNCF for doing uh, scalability and allowing you to write adapters that can trigger the events that will trigger the scaling that you want. Like, um, and it's designed for scaling Kubernetes. So, how many pods do you need? I don't know initially, but I know that I'm going to need like one plus pods. But how, like, what are going to be the input metrics to, to scale that? Well, I either have to be having uh, doing my own infrastructure monitoring or use something like Kato to do it. Um, and with container apps, so we take Kato, which handles things like CPU and memory, um, those kinds of uh, things built in, uh, event uh, systems like Redis or um, like, uh, uh, queuing systems and stuff like that, but putting HTTP over the top of it so you can still deploy your web-based endpoints. Now, are, are we receiving more HTTP requests than we think we should be taking into a single um, pod? Well, then let's scale out. Um, and if we're not uh, receiving anything, well, let's scale that back down to zero. But that's enough slides. Uh, it's been probably, uh, there's probably been a, a bunch of other people that have had slides today, and you're probably slided out. I know that I am. Uh, so let's have a look, a bit of a demo on you know, getting like, a, a, just a quick deployment of a um, container apps app. Um, we'll, um, we'll see that my Cloud Shell has timed out. Awesome. Uh, so I'm just going to log into Cloud Shell, and we'll see if. Uh, all my access tokens are still active. Hopefully they are. Excellent. This might take a while, so this is why I said I need mean, yeah, you know, 10 plus minutes. Uh, Cloud Shell is definitely not too bad. Um, I, I'm just using Cloud Shell um, so that I can do the, uh, don't have to worry about installing the Azure CLI and the, um, the various uh, extensions you need for Azure CLI to do um, container apps builds because it's still in preview, so you, you are, um, yeah, yes, you've got a question there. I have people at that can't see my hand up. But you're not in the Azure portal there or in a web browser. How are you doing that? Oh, yes. So, uh, so I am, I'm using uh, Azure Cloud Shell <laughs> from Windows Terminal. I don't know how I set it up. I think I just found uh, like it just automatically set up when I install Windows. So it's an option you can do uh, and then say Cloud Shell. Yeah, I think, I think Windows Terminal has an option in there built in that allows you to add it. Um, and then when it pops up, it'll ask you what Azure um, uh, instance you want to sign into. Um, I pre did that because I didn't want to have to type my password in while I'm on stage or anything like that. Um, but yes. One, one pro tip is don't set it as the default terminal for Windows Terminal. Yes. When you open Windows Terminal and your session is typed out, all sorts of malarkey occur. Oh, yes, that's probably a good idea, yeah. And, or if you're offline, yeah. So um, I, 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 I tend to do this just because um, then it's. It, I always forget that when you're in the browser, you've got to do Control Shift V, and that just like it, it, I, I'm sitting there Control V because I've copied and pasted something from like tutorial. I'm like, why aren't you pasting? What are the, what's wrong with this keyboard? And then I uh, Shift Control Shift V. Damn browsers! Who would have thought they were a good idea? Um, okay, so just to show you this, um, the things you uh, need to do. So uh, we need to install a extension. So uh, so we're going to need to install the extension called um, Container Apps uh, and um, it's always a good idea to just rush, run the dash dash upgrade flag whenever you're installing extensions, just in case you don't in the past. Make sure that that's there. Uh, and then we need to register the namespace provider with uh, the Azure CLI at Microsoft.app. 
Um, the reason you've got to do that one is that container apps originally had a different namespace that it worked under. Uh, so if you've got an old version or if you've ever played with container apps before, maybe when like, you, you watch the Ignite demos, um, you might have just some outdated stuff. So uh, install the extension, uh, make sure that it's all updated, that you're updated with the right namespace. Uh, and the next thing that I'm going to do is uh, run through the steps that I had previously done. Oh no, my environment variables are gone. So I need to, I'm going to tell some environment variables uh, for the resource that we're going to deploy. Uh, where's my VS Code? Let's just see if I still have these in my clipboard history. I think I do. Uh, there we go. Optimize yourselves while someone fumbles around on the keyboard. Okay, <laughs> we're gonna uh, we're gonna deploy one. Um, I'm just gonna set up a resource group. Uh, so because it's preview, it's in only a subset of Azure regions. Um, I'm gonna use the kind of the central one, and uh, I'm gonna create. One. A container apps environment named Aaron's awesome name. Okay, so we're going to do AZ group. So I'm going to create a resource group for this uh, to uh, deploy into. So I know which one to delete uh, afterwards. I really should take a tip from um, Jeff Holland. Uh, so he's one of the teams at Microsoft. He has a, uh, an Azure function that just runs, and uh, two weeks after any time, he, uh, uh, every two weeks, it will um, find resource groups that have got a particular suffix and just auto delete them for him so he doesn't leave uh, demo ones around, and that's something I really should do because I have so many resource groups and I can't remember what half of them are for. All right, so there is the resource group created. And the next thing I need to do is I need to create the container apps environment. So I'm going to run AZ container, uh, container app and create, uh, give it the name of the environment, so it's just from that environment variable, and uh, the resource group that I want to use, and then again, the location that I want to do that in. So we'll keep that off. Um, so this will take a, a moment or two because this is starting to spin up the, well, essentially an underlying Kubernetes infrastructure for me in Azure. Um, I, we know it's Kubernetes because we advertise that it's running Kubernetes under the hood, but I don't have to think about any of that kind of stuff. I don't have to, well, there, there is no YAML that I have to write to deploy any of this. Um, I, even for a more complex application, you still don't have to learn Kubernetes um, YAML to, to do that, which is a huge plus in my book uh, because it is something that as I said, I've been avoiding learning for years. This a little bit longer um, uh, because I don't actually have this demo pre prepared. Because it turns out that uh, if you want to use container apps at the moment, because it's in preview, uh, you can only deploy uh, two instances on that. And I wanted to deploy one potentially during the talk, which meant that I had to delete the pre done demo that I had because I have another demo that uh, we might go to if there is time. Uh, and I'm being told there is plenty of time. So, yeah, you've got about four hours. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not like it's a nice day outside uh, that, that anyone would want to be getting to. It's okay. coming up for your talk anyway, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's just about done. Um, and the last thing I need to do is uh, copy from my notes on the last command that I need to create, which is going to be a deployment. I, I'm going to use our uh, <coughs> sample template, no, sorry, a sample, sample Docker container. Oh, I thought it was done because running had vanished, but it turns out it wasn't done. Um, all right, we'll give this about five more minutes of me just kind of tap dancing up the front to see if it does deploy. Um, if not, I'll go to, I do have another demo of container apps deployed um, that we can go to uh, if, it, if it doesn't work, but yeah. Uh, are there any questions so far? Yes, I see a hand popping up down the back. So once you deploy the application to the uh, container apps, is it possible to still use tools such as Rancher over the top to, to manage and... So uh, the, the question for recording and for um, other people that might not have caught it uh, the, was, can you use like, the, the Kubernetes tooling like Rancher and stuff like that over the top once it's deployed? Um, no, because we actually kind of abstract away Kubernetes for you, so you don't have, like, you, you don't have access to the, the, the Kubernetes hosting infrastructure um, underneath. Um, we, we, are, we expose some of the, the stuff, so like you know, the concept of pods, so you, you can um, access that, so you can define your scalability and, and things like that. But you don't get, like, if you want to, like, if you wanted to get more power out of Kubernetes, then you better with something like AKS, so Azure Container Service, um, because that will give you the flexibility we get. Right? You can do this uh, other traditional management that you'd be looking for. Um, but no, uh, you, uh, that, that might change in the future, I don't know. But right now, you can't connect to the Kubernetes. 
um, like back plane or anything like that with inside Badger. Excellent. Uh, so thank you for uh, helping me stall for time. Uh, while that while that stalling happened, uh, we were able to get that created. So the last thing is uh, we're going to uh, kick off a deployment to ContainerX. So uh, yeah, ContainerX create. We're giving out, uh, giving it a name, um, my ContainerX, because that's super imaginative, and I forgot to, to update that um, in my notes. Um, use the, the stuff that we had the, the resource group and environment from before. Uh, and uh, so I'm just pulling down a container apps uh, sample uh, image from uh, one of our public registries. But this is where you could be, uh, you plug into your container registry, whether it's a public or a private one um, or anything like that. Uh, because this is going to be on a, H it's a HTTP triggered um, application, or sorry, it's a, it's a website. <laughs> HTTP triggered, I, I'm thinking of that server, so it's HTTP triggered. What, what? There's a name for that. There's a name for that website. <laughs> Um, and, and just getting the, uh, the fully qualified domain name at the end. Uh, so it pops that out into the terminal, um, which is exceedingly long, but it's uh, my container apps, uh, Mongo, uh, Mango Wave, a bit of a shah in Canada Central. But this, we can pop into a browser, which we'll find down here, and do that across. All that to deploy a website that has a big <laughs> Woohoo! Web scale, like this is why we need Kubernetes, is to scale that kind of stuff out. Uh, but no, the, the reason I wanted to actually go through that demo is I wanted to just um, have a bit of a look at what we get when we do like set up that infrastructure. So you can kind of see what that looks like. And this is what I call it. I call it there it is. So there's um, there, there's three resources that get deployed uh, with this. We have our uh, container apps environment, so that's the first one there, uh, our endorsement environment. And we have the container app that's deployed into that environment, and then we just have a log analytic workspace there so we can get some uh, insights into what's uh, appearing there. If we have a look into the environment, so this is uh, this is the what surface area we expose around Kubernetes. So this is your uh, your, your uh, insights. Um, there's not a whole lot of stuff that we uh, can do. You know, possibly they're adding some stuff when this does go public. Uh, so it comes out of preview, I, I'm not sure. Um, but we can see here, like, where is it located? Um, the, the apps are deployed. I can see, I can, I, I've only got a single app in here. Um, I can come into the app, um, get a list of those. I can jump through to set container app. Uh, and then I can start having a look at things like, well, uh, uh, manage the, uh, like the, the, the ingress options uh, and things like that. So this is got HTTP ingress enabled because this is a uh, something that I need external access for. But if I had um, something where like, I've got the, the API backend for this website, well, maybe I deployed that without HTTP ingress so that it could be uh, talked to between uh, the, the other microservices or the, the distributed monolith that we've got in there. Uh, and that can be done by Dapper, uh, which is essentially running gRPC and the backend. Uh, and you don't actually see that. You don't have external access to those deployed applications. Um, we can see what, what's the container information that we've got here. Um, we'll see this told me that it's deployed from the, the public um, container registry. Uh, that's the image, that's the, uh, the, rev, the rev tag and things like that. Um, we can do revisions, so that, uh, we, can do, like, we can even do things like A-B testing by leveraging the revision sets inside of container apps. Um, I, I've done a single deployment, so we can see that that one's there, but over time you would end up with more and more deployments. So you can do rollbacks as well, because you, you can see the, the previous containers in there. Um, and lastly, uh, we can see what our scalability information is set at the moment. Um, I've just got like obviously the, the default, which is a zero to ten um, uh, scale set. So it, like, if I was to slam this with something like Gatling, it would just like spit up a heap of HTTP requests. Um, it would automatically scale up to a max of ten replicas uh, with inside of this uh, in this instance. So I'd end up with ten copies of that container. Um, and this is just your, your basic HTTP scaling that's set up. But using edits, we can go in and, and change that if we wanted other events, if we wanted um, you know, CPU or memory uh, monitoring and stuff like that. Uh, and that will actually trigger a new deployment of this application. So we'll end up with that as a new revision so that I can then roll that back if I realize that you know, maybe I've been overly aggressive in what I've done as my, my, my memory management. It's, it's like, you know, it's too, too low the limits that I've set. I'm scaling out faster than I should. Um, before I wrap up, I do actually want to have a look at a slightly more complex uh, deployment that I've got here. So uh, I've deployed, uh, this is one of our samples. Um, again, I'll put the link up online, but it's at um, github.com slash azure samples slash container apps 
uh, container apps store API and microservice. Um, this is my fork of it uh, because uh, it's set up so that you can use GitHub Actions to deploy this into Azure. So I fork it into my repo, um, add my um, connection information into Azure, so a, a service principle, uh, and then run the GitHub Actions at, uh, at the point. Uh, but this is a node API um, that can be surfaced via API management. So we can put like a, a management layer in front of our API infrastructure. But that node API is actually fronting two other APIs, one written in Go, one written in Python. So you know, this is kind of your, like, your overly architected uh, like microservice API. Every team is running in their own language, which is naturally going to make things more difficult as we go down. You want to move like you know, from a from a development standpoint, that can make things harder. Um, but this is using things like Gapper to do the communication between, because the backends, the, the API in Go and Python, are not publicly exposed, um, they, so they don't have external ingress. So uh, communication is done by uh, from the node app backwards through um, gRPC uh, and, and stuff like that. So I've got this deployed into Azure, and we'll find that one up here in this one. So now we'll have a larger set of um, resources. Uh, where so let's go into the container apps environment. Just because the screen is a little bit small and it's not showing everything. So we've got uh, we have three apps this time. Uh, so one is the node app, and then we've got the, the other two uh, backends. Oops. Why would I ever need to copy that? Copy the clipboard that I have a number three. Awesome. <laughs> um, so we, we can see those there. We can see their revisions that have been deployed. Um, I, I can come in and look at each of those independently. Uh, I can manage scaling on those independently. I know that the node is uh, the node app is the front end that anyone can hit. So maybe that needs to have like a higher scale threshold because that's the that's the in, entry point into our application compared to like our Go or Python apps where they are only dealing with a subset of the overall application traffic. So I, I can come in and manage all of these uh, independently. Um, uh, and the reason I've got API management in front of that is that just to show you that you can then combine that to, to put uh, like additional policies over the front in terms of like how you would manage access to a microservices or sorry to, to an API backend. Um, but yeah, so this is how you can do something that is uh, a multi-app deployment and how it looks. We have a application a container apps environment that looks at everything as a collective, what is in there and how they communicate to each other, uh, sorry, and, and manage those as a whole unit. And then you can do things on the individual uh, level. Uh, so yeah, like if we jump into, let's go into one of the backend services. Um, oh, and yeah, you can do things like, they, they have their own secret management. So like, there's, there's no point in having, say, the, the database backend. Uh, oh, that does have HTTP ingress in it. Whoops. Oh, wait, but it's only available in the container apps environment. Um, so maybe it's using, but I thought it was using data. Anyway, um, so, so you can have um, app secrets defined per app as well. So there's no point for one service that needs to talk to like your SQL database, where the other one is talking to a like a Postgres or a Cosmos or anything like that. You don't want the connection strings on every single service. You have them on the apps as well. Uh, I did see a hand pop up, but it popped back down. Yeah. So I'm going to. Uh, I was going to ask the target for can you use that like to enforce um, HTTPS across? Communication or uh, yeah, yeah, is that to um, to do like yeah HTTPS enforcement across all um, uh, for an individual application? Um, I think it is HTTPS by default though. I think you've got to do a bunch of additional stuff if you want HTTPS turned off. Um, and I don't know if we restrict that for well, in your uh, last ingress screen. You had, had port eighty uh, listed there, so yeah. uh, so that's the container port um, okay. that it's listening to. Right. So uh, not the not the port that you're exposing externally. I don't. Think. Oh, um, I would have to double check that though. Um, have a look at that afterwards um, if you like. But rather than keep you here for, forever, I will actually wrap up uh, before the sun starts going down. Uh, but that was a quick look at two different ways we can use containers in a serverless architecture. There was Azure Functions, which is more of that traditional serverless design mindset. It's very event based, um, it, uh, but it does have some of the limitations because of the way that it does eventing. But its scalability is, is, is super powerful. Uh, but if we want to build maybe a more complex application or an application that has more distributed components um, to it, and we want to manage a bit more of that infrastructure, but still have it treated in a serverless manner, and we can still get some of the niceties out of serverless, well, container apps um, is worth checking out. Uh, container apps, I'll just reiterate, is in preview. Um, so I would not encourage you to use that in a production workload, just because um, well, you don't get the SLAs and 
Um, things might change when it goes public out, or whatever that happens um, here. So your mileage may vary if you're going to run a preview service in production. But, um, thanks for having me. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the entire event. Um, and stick around for the prize draw. <laughs>